When you see value in all directions, you add value in all directions. Accenture. Let there be change. And we are live. Hello and good morning. Uh, welcome to CDO IQ Symposium. I have a great um, opportunity to introduce panels of experts today. Uh, with us is Denis Zhang, who is the Strategic Initiatives Office at the um, CEO Office of Accenture. Uh, Julie Shah, uh, pleased to meet you, uh, Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. And then we have Ali Shah, who is Global Principal Director of for Responsible AI at Accenture. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll hand over to Ali to take the panel forward. Thank you, Baz. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening to those um, uh, uh, participants who are joining us remotely or in person. It's really great to be able to uh, come and speak to you today and share some of our perspectives on um, regulation, ethics, data, talent, and some of the key challenges and how to navigate them. Uh, as Baz said, my name is Ali, uh, Global Principal Director for Responsible AI at Accenture. My role is really to help the organization um, provide support to clients and really help our clients understand how to navigate and implement responsible approaches to new technologies such as AI. Um, prior to joining Accenture, I'm a fairly recent joiner, uh, but prior to joining Accenture, I was Head of Technology Policy at the UK Information Commissioner's Office. That's the independent regulator for data protection, privacy, uh, and data uh, rights. My role there covered AI regulatory policy and, and many of the regulatory uh, policy outcomes and, and products that have been produced by the ICO over the last few years were delivered by me and my team when I was at the ICO. Um, alongside me, I have two expert colleagues who will be joining the discussion. So I just want to uh, take a couple of minutes just to introduce them. So. Firstly, Julie Shaw, would you just tell everyone who's uh, listening in a little bit about yourself? Hi there, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm, I'm Julie Shaw, I'm a professor at MIT. I'm an AI researcher and I run a robotics lab here at MIT. I also hold a role as Associate Dean of Social and Ethical Responsibilities of Computing within the New Schwartzman College of Computing. Um, my uh, area of research focuses on developing artificial intelligence that facilitates more effective collaboration between um, people and machines. So I develop intelligent decision support for experts, doctors, nurses, uh, fighter pilots, as well as develop collaborative robots that work alongside people in, in factory settings and um, uh, very related to questions around sort of positive visions for, for, for work of the future. Uh, and in my role as associate dean, um, I work on uh, leading new efforts to re-envision um, and implement uh, the training of computer scientists and engineers to be able to innovate, develop, and field technology, specifically computing, uh, responsibly. Thank you, Julie. That's fantastic. And Denise Jenk, uh, would you introduce yourselves and tell everyone a little bit about your role and what you do? Sure, absolutely. It's good to be here with you, Ali and, and Julie. Um, what a pleasure. Um, so I'm Denise Jung. I am a managing director for strategic initiatives in the office of the CEO at Accenture, where I've led a number of, of initiatives for, for Julie Sweet, our CEO, um, ranging from responsible AI um, to other topics, uh, but I'll just maybe stick to the topic at hand today. Um, so I have a kind of a, um, a blend of different uh, types of, of expertise. I um, I've uh, worked in advanced technology R&D research programs at DARPA. Um, I've developed uh, policy and strategy as well, having been one of the principal authors of the Cybersecurity Act of 2012 and coordinated um, cross industry initiatives on AI, on data privacy, on cybersecurity, digital identity issues, working with CEOs of, of US Fortune 500 companies. 
Um, and I'm really excited to be on this panel today to talk about responsible AI, but also a new focus area for me as well, which is metaverse and how to navigate the metaverse and web three technologies and build responsibility into um, how, we, how we begin to, to design, develop, deploy that technology. So really excited to be here, really excited for this conversation. Thank you, Denise. And, and so I feel like we definitely have the right experts on this panel with Julie and Denise to have this conversation. And, and the structure for the next sort of 55 minutes or so is that we will bring out some of the themes that you're all interested in and, and try and drive that discussion and, and hopefully share some insights. But I'm also really keen to make sure that we have participation from audience members, people who are listening in. So please, as we start discussing, get your questions ready. There will be time towards the end, the last third of this sort of uh, hour that we've got to try and answer some of your questions. So I'm really hopeful and, and would really encourage you to try and jot down the thoughts that you have and we will do our level best to try and answer those. I just wanted to open by referencing uh, the survey that Sanjeev Vora, one of our senior leaders at Accenture presented yesterday. And I was really listening with interest to the data that he was sharing about the survey that was conducted just this year uh, in May. And something struck me in the context of our discussion today, and that was really around what are the key priorities and the key challenges for chief data officers? And I think if you dive into some of that detail of that survey, you'll see, and, and what we heard from all of you is that driving innovation is one of the key things that all of you are really focused on. And how do you do that in the context of data and AI technologies when there is increasing regulation, but also questions around how to be responsible, how to be ethical, how to do um, develop services that can really innovate and open up new markets, new opportunities, but do so in a way where you have confidence around your approach. And I think that, that priority around innovation really struck home to me and was really clear. I think alongside that, one of the key challenges that was really clear from that survey that you're all saying is a key challenge for you, the top one was around good data governance, managing the ethical issues, being responsive to the compliance requirements, but also really thinking about talent. How do you at all levels, where, whether it's the C-suite or down to the product designers, engineers, and data scientists, how do you make sure that you have the right talent pool and the right cultures to try and execute your strategies and your business imperatives, right? How do you deal with that? So making sure that the governance management approach and, and the talent questions can be resolved is also front of mind for everyone who was surveyed. And I think hopefully our panel is almost engineered to try and bring that discussion to life a little bit. What we're going to try and do is touch on some of those points and we'll bring in Denise's experience and Julie's to try and elaborate on that. I wanted to open though with just a few words. So I think we're having this discussion within uh, a, a context where data use and AI is just rapidly growing as an imperative for every single business. You know, Our society is already data driven and AI driven in many contexts, but we're very much at the beginning of the opportunities that data and AI enables. And I think we all see the positive benefits to our businesses, our consumers and our fellow citizens from these technologies and, and the use of data. But I think the last few years has also shown us that there are real consequences for getting things wrong it, when, and real harms that can occur for citizens, but also for organizations when something has gone wrong. How do you deal with the consequence for your customers and consumers? How do you deal with the impact on your brand if citizens feel they can't trust you anymore? How do you deal with the regulatory scrutiny that might come from having something not going the way that you intended it to go? So navigating those sorts of challenges while benefiting from the technology is something that we're all thinking about every single day. But the landscape is just getting more complicated. I think if you look at the UK and the EU, the regulation of AI is already here in many ways. So if you have, over the last few years, thought about implementing and put in play, having put in place compliance requirements for GDPR, well, there are aspects of GDPR that really require you to think about how you develop, deploy, manage, consume, buy AI services. That's already here. Those requirements are continuing across the UK and the EU. But also sector regulators are already thinking and trying to supervise and, and uh, regulate the use of AI, whether it's financial authorities thinking about the use of AI in use cases such as fraud detection or uh, credit risk scoring, whether it's uh, regulators thinking about the use of AI in HR or recruitment, or broader horizontal regulators such as competition authorities. Again, across the EU and the UK, there has been an increased focus from regulators who are evaluating 
the consequences of a use case, but really recognizing that AI is the enabler for that use case. And so how to supervise and regulate AI and how to consider the ethical and responsibility questions that come is becoming front of mind for regulators across the EU and the UK. But it doesn't stop there. I think if you are, have been following this area, you'll have seen that uh, there is other regulation coming um, in the, across the EU, the DSA, the Digital Services Act will be coming in and really um, supervising the use of online content, advertising, primarily focused around large content, uh, social media type operators. But for attendees to this panel, if you're in that supply chain, maybe you're, maybe you're one of those organizations or maybe you're providing services to one of those organizations, you may be impacted by those regulations. In the UK, the Online Safety Bill is also looking at content moderation, but again, underpinned by questions around AI regulation and what are the issues around AI. But of course, I think the major development that's coming from the EU is the upcoming EU AI Act. So this new piece of legislation is going to really define the standards and controls around how to um, develop, deploy, utilize AI, and what are the sorts of requirements that are needed to manage risk. And I think risk is going to be one of the common themes that we'll bring up in, in this conversation. Most of the regulations that we're seeing globally around AI are really risk-based. And asking those questions around, are there any applications that are so severely harmful that we should prohibit them? But what about some applications that might be high risk? How would we manage them? And what should we do around applications that might be lower risk where we don't want to stifle innovation, but we still want to supervise? So I think the EU Act is really codifying that. It will be coming to, it's being, going through a process of being uh, reviewed and ratified and is likely to come into force in a couple of years time, but ratified within a, the next six months to a year. That's a, that's a, don't quote me on that period because anybody who's really worked in legislative arenas knows that the dates around how, when legislation gets ratified precisely can shift. But that's our expectation that this uh, piece of legislation is going to mobilize quite quickly over the coming months and years and be impactful to anybody operating inside the EU, but also for organizations outside the EU where the EU market is significant to your business. So it is likely to have that extra territorial effect, similar to what GDPR had. So what do you do about this? And I think I just want to finish on, on a couple of points before I bring in my colleagues uh, by saying that one of the things that Accenture has been doing is really helping clients understand how to make being responsible, practical and simple. Now, how do you make sure that in the context of a broad range of regulations, but also the broader societal conversation around responsibility, ethics, and, and how to do the right thing, and the conversations our clients are having with us around wanting to be recognized for being leaders in responsible data use and AI, how do you make that practical and simple? And so Accenture helps many clients in creating frameworks that can help an organization regardless of where they are on their data transformation journey. So perhaps you're coming at this from a technology transformation uh, lens. Uh, we have a significant uh, uh, capability in data science and AI, and we often help clients with projects uh, around that sort of technical challenge and, and bringing in our skills and experience and talent. But we can also then build on that and help organizations understand how to engineer for responsibility. But we're increasingly also seeing clients asking us to help them with questions around data governance and data ethics, and really understanding how to build that robust approach that will be flexible enough to meet the different demands and requirements of regulation as it becomes codified and starts to impact their business, you know, building in that agility. And I think that agility in responsiveness is necessary to try and enable that confident approach to innovation that most of our clients are really coming to speak to us about. So I think that's something that we're seeing and in the context of the regulations across the EU and the UK, something that's really driving conversation. I'll pause there because I really now want to bring in my colleagues. And, and Denise, I know that in the context of what I've just been discussing, you have also been really thinking about and have some experience around how regulations across North America are developing. Do you see some of the trends that we're seeing and some of the headwinds that we're seeing across the EU and the UK being replicated or represented in the North American context? Can you just elaborate and share some of your perspective? Yeah, I would say absolutely. I mean, I, I think when you look across the United States, there's a tremendous amount of interest in responsible AI and how do we 
make sure that we have the right governance mechanisms in place. I think that the approach, however, has been very different from, from the, the approach taken by the EU, right? Um, so, you know, from Brussels to G7, from the White House to Congress, um, you know, states and cities included, um, we see a lot of policymakers now pretty busily sort of drafting and implementing regulations. Um, there are about two dozen now U.S. municipalities that have actually banned the use of, of facial recognition software by the by the government, the local government. And you know, the the concern that they're citing is around accuracy of um, facial recognition technologies, but also discrimination issues. We also see a lot of activity around the use of AI in hiring and employment decisions. So take, for example, New York City, which recently passed a law limiting the use of AI in, in, in hiring practices, right? Um, and and uh, requiring now companies to conduct uh, a bias audit before using any tools. And, and in fact, also notifying employees as well as job candidates of the use of AI. Um, Illinois also enacted a law um, somewhat similar that requires companies to, to notify the job candidates when they're using AI in hiring practices as well. And there are also even um, access and, and retention restrictions on um, interview videos of candidates. So we're seeing a lot of activity all of a sudden um, around facial recognition, around fairness and bias in AI, especially in hiring. And, um, and a lot of that activity is at the, state, at the state level. And at the federal level, I think there's a lot of uh, curiosity and, and interest um, in fact, the, the federal uh, data privacy legislation has some algorithmic transparency clauses in the draft bill. We'll see if that actually advances through the House and Senate. Um, but, uh, you know, as usual, the federal government's a bit, bit slower to act on this type of stuff than, than at the state level, where we really see sort of more of a, a laboratory of, of regulation happening. And you know, I'll just say that even in Washington State and California, they have also proposed similar uh, bills around the use of AI in housing um, and and health related decisions. So I think you know, a tremendous amount of interest in this, a lot more state activity than federal level activity, and really focused on some of these use cases in the areas of employment, in health, housing. Um, and, and of course, uh, 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 facial recognition and, and biometric related data. So really interesting, Denise. And, and I would say if you were sat in the audience right now and you're a chief data officer and you're thinking about how do I drive data use, data transformation and use of AI, but responsibly, you might be listening to what I've said and what you've just said and think, oh my, there is such a tapestry of regulations out there, so many different regulations, whether it's what I was saying about the EU and, and the UK, but also the state and federal uh, regulations that you've described, that can feel overwhelming in terms of how do you navigate that. Do you see that as a challenge, that there is a whole range of different regulations that will need to be faced into? Or do you see some common themes, some common issues that chief data officers and others can really start to build towards, build a strategy to try and address? You know, can you just touch on that? Yeah, I think I think taking a page out of the playbook in terms of how companies have handled compliance with data privacy laws might be instructive here, right? So GDPR is still to date the most comprehensive consumer data privacy law. And it sets a relatively high bar. And in fact, I would argue that even in the United States and at the state level, it has been looked at as one of the, the models for how we craft legislation in North America. Um, and, and so what we've seen companies do is, is sort of take GDPR and put it across their full, whole, whole firm, implement it across their whole business. Right, and, and I think that that approach to some degree has worked. It doesn't always work because of jurisdictional challenges and really differences in some of these in, in the regimes in terms of how you demonstrate compliance and what specific requirements uh, uh, that you need to comply with. But generally speaking, a lot of companies, I, I think larger companies have taken sort of the highest standard and tried to apply it across the business. And also at the same time, sort of understanding what are the business impacts, right? So at the end of the day, it's always kind of a, a an assessment of, of the, 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 the 
risks and benefits of doing that. But generally, I, I, I think that has been effective. In terms of what to do with regard to responsible AI, I would say, you know, I think this, the, the issue that you raised, Ali, is exactly what brought the business roundtable and the CEOs of the business roundtable to this issue, which is realizing that all of a sudden we're kind of reaching an AI tipping point, right? We've been talking about responsible AI, the benefits of AI, the transformational power of AI for so long, but the pandemic accelerated AI adoption. And there was really kind of an over, you know, overnight, kind of a, a new sense of urgency to embrace AI and make it um, much more important as a lifeline for many companies to survive during, during the pandemic, right? There's a lot more automation, a lot more use of platforms, a lot more use of data. And so we saw companies, you know, move from kind of like siloed experimentation to adopting AI more at scale. And I think that, that what that did for executives was it helped them realize there are some real new risks and realities that they have to cope with. Oh, and I, that at the same time, Sorry. I'm interrupting your flow, but I'm just aware that many in the audience may not be aware of the business roundtable and the role that Julie and other CEOs played in your role. Can you just contextualize that for them? Because we definitely want to dive into the sorts of issues you were just about to touch on. You know, what's front and center of mind for CEOs is yeah. what I think we're about to go into. But if you can just contextualize the BRT for, sure. for people involved. Sure. So business roundtable is an association of CEOs of large U.S. Fortune 500 companies. It's essentially the largest U.S. firms, um, most of which are global, of course, as well. And together they kind, you know, the work, the work they do is sort of tackle big societal and policy related challenges that have major implications for business and come up with frameworks, with codes of conduct, with policy advocacy positions, and even legislative proposals. And then as an organization, Business Roundtable will actually go ahead and advocate for them. So I think you have many organizations like that across Europe and elsewhere. Uh, like the European Roundtable, for example, and even the World Economic Forum does this kind of work. BRT is kind of the, the prime principal entity in the United States, um, a venue for, for, for CEOs to convene. So as I was saying, you know, I think it was really this, this sort of accelerated adoption of AI, this recognition of the risks associated with it. And then the, the fact that governments are moving to regulate, as you say, Ali, that uh, you know, CEOs kind of came together and decided, okay, we need to do something about this and come up with one common framework, one set of norms and practices that we can all adhere to. And that is going to be flexible and encompass, you know, the, whether it's the EU approach or the UK approach or the state level approaches. And that it's very much also tied to the purpose of a corporation and stakeholder capitalism. Whether you believe in that or not, it's really gaining traction as an issue, right? And, and as a way of a frame of doing business today. And so they came together, the CEOs, and created a roadmap for responsible AI. And I would say just in a nutshell, the, the roadmap is quite extensive. I won't go into all the details, but in a nutshell, it's all about, you know, first and foremost, making AI trusted and inclusive and how to mitigate unfair bias and build in transparency and explainability into the system. The second piece is really about, you know, ensuring that it's, it's safe, it's effective, it's secure, right? Because we're gonna see a lot of AI embedded increasingly more, and this is relevant to Julie's work, robotics into cyber physical systems, right? And ensuring that AI algorithms are truly fit for purpose and mitigate some of those foreseeable harms when the two come together. And then third is to implement, you know, strong governance and accountability frameworks, because you can put in these great practices, but you need to have a strong accountability and governance framework around it that really instills kind of a company wide culture of responsible AI to truly operationalize this. So, I think that you know the the business roundtable work was was important. It was a good call to action, and um, uh, you know that I think companies really started to align around what's needed. So, so just to add a couple of perspectives to that, and, and firstly, touching on the earlier point you were making about GDPR and its influence, especially in North America, and in, in in influencing the mindset of CEOs and others. As an ex GDPR regulator in the UK context, when I was at the ICO, two things struck me really. One was the huge amount of effort that was invested by organizations in trying to understand how to conform and comply with GDPR. You know, some organizations had started 
early and had prepared. Others came very late to the deadline and, and there was a huge amount of effort going in. But it felt like everyone tried to breathe a sigh of relief, you know, a year after GDPR, you know, we've, we've done the conformance, we've ticked the box, we know we've got some data and governance controls in place. But at the same time, the thing that kept my team busy and me busy was, well, what are the implications from a personal data, PII perspective, GDPR perspective, we, when we are thinking about AI? And, and all of the points you've just raised that CEOs and others at BRT were thinking about came to the fore. So things like accountability and trustworthiness and trust, how do you really engender that? How do you test for that? Thinking about transparency and how does that work? And, and as I look forward to the regulations that are coming, I see those same themes really driving the risk-based approach that different regulators are, are taking. So it feels like the, there are some common things that are driving all of these different regulatory developments, but also the broader social conversation around why it's absolutely an imperative, but also a valuable thing to be responsible, you know, to sustain your business. Things like fairness and transparency, as, as we mentioned. Of course, the challenge is, what do you do with that insight, right? That common insight that we need to have a plan for and a way to execute being transparent and accountable and trustworthy and fair. That's great, but how do you do that? So I just want to sort of dig into the issues and, and approaches that we might explore around really building capacities and capabilities around that. And, and Denise, before I bring Julian, I just want to try and um, get your first perspective and then we'll maybe sort of pivot to bringing Julian to the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think Julie has a lot more to say on this than I do, in fact, because she's been building a protocol and a toolkit and really putting it into practice in the academic setting. So I will let her, I don't want to steal her thunder, and I couldn't even if I tried. But I <clears throat> I would say that, you know, I think I think what we're seeing is that, um, you know, first and foremost, we need a data strategy that involves how, you know, that has a, a critical sort of trust and accountability piece to it. Understand the provenance of the data. Truly try to achieve diverse data sets and be able to map the outsides and, I'm sorry, the, the outcomes and insights that are generated by AI systems to um, sort of the, the source of the data as well, right? And, and understand sort of the, the provenance, the process, and how to create a system that is truly you know, more explainable, more transparent. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done in this space from, a, from an engineering and R&D and technical perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that we have Julie on the panel who can speak to some of that work. Um, but, but I think that there are a number of practices that, that companies can begin to put in place, right? From thinking about how do you build multidisciplinary and truly diverse teams um, across your, your, your um, not just your, your sort of data science and machine learning teams, but also across your business that are going to be using those insights, right? And, and truly, you know, making sure that, 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 uh, that there's an inclusive, you're designing for inclusion, and you're also being inclusive in terms of, of how, how you're designing your teams. Um, so maybe I'll just pause there. Just to... Um, Pick up that point, and, and Julie, I think, you know, building on what Denise was just saying, I think thinking about how to deal with bias and discrimination, that is still an issue, but over the last few years, there have been lots of work done by industry, academia, regulators, and other civil society to try and really system systematize some approaches to dealing with those issues, while other issues around bias, discrimination, and fairness still persist, and we'll need to do new thinking. There is also a effort going on within organizations, but also within regulators and, and others around trying to understand how do you really practically understand the, the needs that you have around talent and, and trying to build the right interdisciplinary and diverse teams, but also how do you assess the consequences of this technology and set of technologies? It keeps evolving and growing in its importance. And actually, as an aside, it's one of those insights I had coming from industry originally into regulation that regulators go on their own learning journey, right? They're also figuring out, okay, what is the implication of, of uh, bias and discrimination uh, when it comes to AI? How do you build explainability when you might have black box algorithms? There's, there's a range of open questions and challenges that regulators also work through. So they, they are often doing this in concert with industry, but also civil society and others. But fundamentally, those two questions really still persist. One is, 
how will our talent, whether it's C-suite or engineers or business leaders in any part of the business, understand what to do and how to come together and work. But also some of the implications of these technologies will, will manifest themselves in, in years to come. How do we understand the consequences? So just wondering if you could sort of explain some of the things that you and MIT have been doing in this space and add to the conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, it, you know, the the vision and the aim of um, our efforts at, at CERC, uh, Social and Ethical Responsibilities of Computing here at MIT, um, are to actively weave social, um, uh, ethical, and policy considerations into our teaching, research, and implementation of computing. And, you know, the one of the key questions is, you know, how do we go from these values, principles, guidelines, and then how does that inform the, um, the bread and butter, the everyday decisions um, and actions um, of uh, practitioners? So you think about um, the training of physicians or those in healthcare in terms of medical ethics. This is sort of ethics for, for, for practitioners. Um, what, what does it mean as we're training, you know, the, the current generation, not the next generation, the current generation of um, computer scientists, data scientists, um, and engineers? And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, you know, we've been underway with CERC for, for three years now. The, the efforts predate that, but as a, as a formal a formal program. And, um, and it, it's something that, um, you know, is, is, is new. You know, my, my background is aerospace. You know, in other disciplines, we have very long cycles and very well-honed processes for considering, um, you know, social, ethical, and policy considerations of, of the technologies that we're developing. Um, the, uh, you know, the approach we've taken at MIT is to form uh, cross-disciplinary teams um, of faculty uh, to come together and to sit down and, and say, you know, uh, given expertise from anthropology, from the social sciences, from, from philosophy, how does this embed in a, an assignment, in a problem set, in asking our students to select and curate data sets, to label data sets, and making the selection of the, uh, the models they're employing in a machine learning pipeline, um, in making, um, uh, uh, assumptions uh, or uh, you know, decisions around deployment of those technologies and their embedding in a in a social context, um, and uh, you know it's it, it's an incredibly exciting um, you know effort, um, and it's new, and so we're really inventing kind of as we go this this new sort of implementation science. Um, uh, what we know does not work is to bring in a uh, you know, Kantian philosopher at the very end of a machine learning course and have them give an hour and a half lecture. Because what are you left with? How do you how do you you know take that you know sort of foundational theoretical knowledge and apply it to uh, the systems that you're building and, and you're creating? So um, you know the one of the key challenges when when teaching students is to work through with them a process of taking something that feels you know too too expansive and breaking it down into smaller parts that can be uh, that can be pursued um, and uh, and teaching you know not how to answer the questions but how to ask the right questions and how to be able to communicate across disciplines uh, and beyond you know academia to um, a variety of, of stakeholders and so um, as a part of this effort you know we've been we've been quite excited we've been very successful at what we say is basically like uh, you know changing the DNA of what it means to train up a, a computer scientist. Uh, essentially embedding social, ethical, and policy considerations in a very fine-grained way into many, many courses so that, you know, this is not uh, an additional ethics course that students take or an additional lecture at the end of this class or that class, uh, but it's really inescapable in their, in their education. And they come away with habits of mind, but also habits of actions, tool, toolkits, uh, and, and skills, practical skills that they apply reflexively when they're uh, when they're building, you know, a new system and working through the, you know, say uh, machine learning, a machine learning pipeline. Um, and so uh, we do have a, a process that we've honed um, in, in education here at MIT. It comes out of our philosophy department um, developed by uh, philosophers, you know, tra trained here at MIT um, called the Ethical Computing Protocol. And it's a, it's a structured process and toolkit for envisioning the possible futures, um, you know, related to the technology that you're developing. Uh, uh, articulating, you know, what what is what is what is potentially good or bad, and for whom. So, uh, communicating sort of the values laden in, um, uh, you know, in in the endeavor, 
uh, and then in a very fine grained way, mapping out the technology implementation design uh, deployment decisions that you're making, how those map to values and um, how those map to outcomes, um, you know, processes, uh, and then fairness distributions of benefits and burdens um, across across stakeholders. And you know, we're um, uh, the ECP, the Ethical Computing Protocol, as well as the other, you know, materials that we've honed and, and developed, um, been embedded in so many courses. In, in the last, you know, calendar year, about uh, 1,600 students at MIT have seen this material, and it's repeated and sort of echoed um, uh, through through the courses. So, you know, we're training up a, a new generation here that's uh, bringing a broader perspective to the challenges that you know that we need to meet at, at this time, and also a very practical tool set, ways to communicate communicate, ask questions, uh, and be able to follow through, monitor, and, and revisit um, open questions uh, that uh, is really, is really you know, not, not just about you know, doing good in the world, but it's about uh, uh, producing you know, higher quality products and, and technologies. This is, it's really, in, in our view, a question of training our students up to, um, uh, to produce you know, high, high quality uh, deliverables um, and outputs. Thank you, Judy. A huge amount in there that I want to sort of follow up on. And in a second, I'll, Denise, I'll also please feel free to ask questions as we're going through. But Julie, I think for those of us who have been in the AI and data space for some years, uh, we'll recognize maybe even three years ago, or definitely five years ago, there was an assertion that it wasn't practical to try and make our engineers and data scientists and product leaders ethical or understand the ethics of this, right? You know, it's hard enough to try and train people to be good data scientists or good ML engineers, but to also try and then train them to be ethical and philosophers was just not practical. And, and we all were having conversations about building diverse and representative teams with sociologists and ethnographers and, and others in there. But I think it sounds like from the work that you and MIT have been doing, MIT has made the call. It's saying, no, actually you can make computer science students and others consider the responsible and ethical considerations and it needs to be baked in. And I was struck by the, the phrase that you're using around habits of, of mind and habits of action and, and making this something that's inescapable for students in terms of the education and approach. So, so do you think that sort of, we've crossed the Rubicon really around separating out responsibility and ethics and consideration of, of these technologies from the technical dimensions around building products and services. Do you think actually now students of the future will, will definitely have to be educated this way. And I guess the real question for me then is, does that approach also need to apply to industry? How do you see applying to industry? Can we translate what you're doing? I mean, it'd be great if we could all hire MIT educated students, that might not be possible for all of us. So how do you do that? How does it translate into industry and business? Absolutely. You know, to your point, it is not practical to train computer scientists to also be uh, philosophers. And so, you know, that that's sort of the starting point. Um, uh, however, um, it, it, it is, um, you know, it, um, you know, aerospace is that, you know, I, I, I go back to that as an example, you know, it's a systems discipline, right? Like a key part of your education there is not just understanding the thermo and the structure systems and the control systems, uh, but also your, your training in these sort of capstone projects to be able to communicate within a team and uh, understand that if you optimize your particular subsystem and everybody else optimizes their particular subsystem, when you put it together, you're gonna end up with a highly suboptimized <laughs> integrated system. You know, um, uh, but uh, you know those those communication skills to be able to collaborate, you know, across disciplines are taught. They're, they they're not they don't come you know, in, in, you know naturally or intuitively. Um, and what we do require is uh, you know training our our engineers, computer scientists, uh, data scientists to be able to. Um, to uh, know what questions to ask, how to ask those questions to facilitate um, effective inputs from, from those in, in, in other disciplines, uh, to be able to know how to identify what questions they need to ask and what questions they need to, to follow up on. And there's skills associated with that. And there's um, processes that you can utilize and communication tools that you can work with that, that can facilitate that. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, this this is the way this is the way you know we will all be trained going forward. And um, the, the faculty at MIT, we've had um, eighty faculty involved in this effort. You know, we're we're coming up on you know uh, somewhere around ten percent of the overall faculty at MIT. 
um, uh, that are themselves, you know, practicing these new skills of working in these cross disciplinary teams across faculty to hone the new material to be able to train this next generation. So they're modeling how to do this and learning how to do this at the same time. Um, this is something that uh, need, needs to exist beyond the, the educational or academic setting. Um, many of the, the tools and processes that we've honed here at MIT, they're, they're taught in a highly facilitated fashion. So you know, now the, the next uh, phase for us, which we're very excited about, is uh, opening you know, ECP and other, other methods up and, and being able to hone in collaboration um, with city municipalities, with, uh, with industry, um, you know, the right ways to uh, make these practical and embeddable within uh, professional work environments and, and, and how we, much like the faculty here, are climbing a learning curve to be able to teach, uh, you know, how we all climb a learning curve together so that um, uh, responsible AI is not something that's done in a, in a unit separate or is checked before or after, but it's really, uh, it's really a practical set of tools and skills we're bringing through and uh, being um, uh, uh, consumers of data, understanding where it comes from, its uses, uh, why and when, um, you know, one set of techniques should be used as another, but with this uh, sort of much broader perspective. Great. So, so let's dive into that point a little bit around practicality and scaling your approach, which is working for students and faculty. But, you know, in, in business, we have imperatives and pressures. And, you know, why is this an imperative now? And I think, Denise, I, I know with another hat that you wear in Accenture, you're also thinking about responsible metaverse and, and metaverse is going to be powered by AI. Do you, can you see the imperative for the sorts of techniques that Julie's describing? Now, I wonder if I can get you both to answer that difficult question around, sounds great, Julie, and, and really would add value to us over the longer term, but how do we get started with this? You know, what are the things we should be thinking about? Denise, I wonder if you could just open that aspect up around how your thinking has evolved around metaverse and, and we sort of take that point to Julie. Yeah, I think it's absolutely relevant to the metaverse. And um, and I wonder, you know, even Julie, if the framework that you're developing is applicable beyond our responsible AI, because responsible AI is just kind of like one slice, one important slice of what we're concerned about with the metaverse. But beyond that, there's so many privacy, security, trust and safety concerns, content moderation, sustainability, especially when you blend the metaverse tech stack with Web3 and crypto um, and uh, questions around how you build this technology and use it ethically is, is really top of mind. And I think, you know, we're at the stage right now with, with metaverse where we just need to sort of understand sort of what are the different domains, the different dimensions of challenges that we need to deal with and begin to put together some guiding principles, right? Because while we have a, a large body of existing laws and regulations that apply today in the internet today, they will apply in the metaverse. The metaverse does create some new challenges. So we need some guiding principles for that. And then eventually we're gonna have to decide, do we need to pass new laws? Do we need to update new laws? But as we've all discussed, that takes a lot of time. So in the interim, I think very, very important to come up with codes of conduct, to define performance metrics, to engage in self-assessments, all guided by, um, you know, a set of principles and codes of conduct. So I, I think that's a little bit of a general answer. I'll lead to your question, but you know, I'm happy to dive deeper into any of these individual dimensions. I mean, I think responsible AI. I mean, just give, just maybe painting one one particular use case, right? AI is going to fuel the development of highly photorealistic metaverse environments and user experiences. And you can imagine one day where an AI is, is, is used to develop, you know, millions of versions of, of, of a world and customize it to fit the preferences or the interests of the users in that world in real time. And that the future in the future, you could even be interacting with other users in the metaverse, other or other avatars, let's say, that are fully AI agents. I mean, it's it's this is a little bit futuristic, but think about you know how entertainment can be transformed. If we're not going to be watching streaming tele streaming television today is like so one dimensional, right? Not only in terms of the screen that we're watching it in, but how we're engaging it is so it's a one directional type of user experience. 
imagine a future where you're actually embodied in the form of an avatar in the movie itself, interacting with the characters. AI is going to power all of that. You can also think of the, the potential um, pitfalls as well from an ethical standpoint. So, so, so much for us to think through, so much for us to do in terms of developing guiding principles and really studying this set of issues. But I think early on, you know, recognizing some of these challenges, articulating what is the responsible approach, even if it's just a framework, which I think is, is exactly what Julie, you and your, your, um, your team at MIT have put together and, and putting that into practice as we, as we define, as we develop, as we architect this whole new domain. And, and Denise, um, just before we go to questions, Julie, I want to sort of give you the last few minutes, by, but, but really undermining my own question around, you know, Julie shows why this is an imperative, because I think the audience will recognize I've already drunk the Kool-Aid on your approach and, and it's imperative in the same way that Denise is saying. But, you know, having heard what Denise is saying about future opportunities, you know, the metaverse in one, one instance, but there'll be others for many people on the call here. They'll be thinking about their own business area, whether it's automation and, and uh, transport, whether it's healthcare, whether it's recruitment. How does your ECP approach really bootstrap their thinking around innovation and, and helping them have undertake innovation in a more confident way? If you can just elaborate on that for a couple of minutes, that'd be helpful. Yes. Well, one, one thing we hear from our, uh, you know, early beta testers and, you know, external to academia um, collaborators is, uh, you know, one of the values of a structured process for, you know, envisioning these futures and, um, you know, who's at stake, what's at stake for whom is um, uh, that that envisioning step is often the hardest step. So what, what we'll hear is you know, once you've identified a potential harm or a potential concern, the next steps from there are fairly fairly straightforward. But there's always this nagging concern, you know, where, where do I draw the line or what's within my purview to, to be considering here? And um, what are my blind spots that are, are gonna be like the gotcha as we've seen you know, in, in recent years uh, happen? Um, because we are we are human beings, and we don't you know we're not uh, omniscient about what will happen um, you know in the future, uh, and so um, you know uh, honing a structured process to be able to work through and facilitate communication with a with a large variety of uh, stakeholders within and external to an organization and beyond you know customers. Um, uh, is, is is very very important, and th um, these uh, these points are echoed in the um, uh, the soon to be coming out, but is in draft form. The, the National Academies report around um, responsible research in computing, which highlights as recommendations the need to expand the notion of stakeholders and also to be able to communicate across disciplines to be able to you know envision these possible futures and uh, and, and and develop sort of the the concrete ways that. Uh, you can uh, understand these problems at the beginning uh, and at least be able to build in through a life cycle the ability to revisit and understand um, you know, the, the, the implications of a technology as it's developed and as it's deployed. Fantastic. So when we could carry on speaking, there's so much to cover uh, in, this, in this conversation, but we also want to make sure that there's time for questions from audience members. So, Baz, do let us know if there's questions. Uh, we're there's, 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 there's a um, uh, number of questions coming in. Um, excellent discussion from the panel here. Thank you very much. Um, just real practical question coming in, which is, where can I go to to get some of these checklists? And uh, how can I start using these checklists like tomorrow? <laughs> So there's a couple of people asking about where can I go and educate my engineers today to start using these checklists. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. So uh, we are delighted to meet that request very, very soon. These materials are incorporated into, into a variety of classes and are included in some of the open courseware materials um, on the MIT website and, and CERC itself has an open courseware uh, site. And so you can see uh, a variety of uh, course materials across machine learning, just software design studio classes, um, courses in the social sciences and humanities as well that have, that have incorporated these materials. Um, and uh, we do have a version of, of the ECP um, that we're uh, intending to make freely and publicly available. It's in the sort of final editing, uh, you know, web page editing stages, um, but it'll be anticipated it'll be launched uh, by end of summer. Say, say look for it the end of August, and um, we have a, a beta mode in which we're looking for 
uh, and actively you're very excited about working with a number of partners to field and understand you know ECP for uh, sort of for professionals um, and beyond its use in the classroom. And Baz, if I can just build on Julie's answer, because that first question has preempted what I was going to say in my sort of sum up right at the end, which is that we can share some resources and links after this uh, webinar and, and session with others. And for example, building on what Julie's done, Denise has worked with BRT and CSIS. You know, there's there's good thinking and resources there where people can go and see what BRT was discussing and some of the, the key principles that came out of that. But also Accenture has produced a, um, a, a report on how to implement responsible by design, because I think really the conversation that we've been having today is very much about how you do that with a conscious, considered approach to being responsible, putting in place the building blocks that you need to be able to do the sorts of things that Julie's advocating for, but also to give you that agility again, to meet the different headwinds of regulation or societal pressure or uh, considering how to build a long-term sustainable business. So all of that encapsulated in thinking about how to be responsible by design, I think is something that you'll hear from us as Accenture, but also from key actors within the AI ecosystem really promoting. It's one of the things that's really gaining traction. Thank you for that's that. Great take, Aiken. Any great other take. questions? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a, a question which I'm going to uh, turn into um, a, a dimensional model to think about because it's, it's the world is balanced. And it's the balance which Denise covered around uh, regulation, which is um, from whether state or federal or EU, uh, with self-regulation. So that's one dimension of, uh, of balance. The other balance is, and which has come through as a question as well, is between innovation and ethics. And, and, and how do you balance that? The need to innovate and bring new products and, uh, and own markets or products or with, uh, with innovation yet yeah, balance responsible AI. Thoughts on you know, the two balancing acts so, which a company has to put, put through there. Sorry if that I, I'm gonna to pass to Denise in a second, but I can't resist my one cent <laughs> from my days in regulation, which is we need to stop trying to frame these, uh, with due respect to the person who's asking the question, stop trying to frame these as competing objectives that need to be balanced. We need to find ways to reconcile these, right? So innovation should not come at the cost of ethics, and ethics should not come at the cost of innovation. That challenge needs concerted effort again to a responsible by design. But Denise, this question was what was discussed at BRT, you know, the work that you were coordinating and, and leading on at BRT, I think was covering some of these topics. Do you want to answer that question? I think Ali, you answered it the, you know, better than, than I could have. Um, it is not a trade-off. It can't be a trade-off. Okay. And I think when you can align ethics and innovation, that's when you really have competitive advantage. And that's when you can really truly future-proof the investments that you're making as a company today for innovation tomorrow. So um, I really don't, yeah, I don't think we should, I think we should try to debunk that, that, uh, that it's a trade-off. Okay, I'll just cap that off by saying, again, years of experience from within the regulatory world, Regulators will often give you some grace or some latitude if something goes wrong, right? Sometimes things happen. We don't live in a zero risk world. Things can happen. What is less accepted is if there has been that trade off. If, if somebody has traded consumer welfare and protection and, and really thinking about the customer's interest against some other imperative, the best approach is really to think through how you reconcile. So just it's worth knowing that's how regulators think about these things as well, which I think will drive lots of the decision making within organizations okay so it's not really you know, the key point is really it's a you know not don't trade these off it's it's really you know what's the right thing to do in in both uh acts of balancing this uh as we go forward and another sort of uh, more sort of follow-on question isn't this kind of you know responsible AI really respond really targeted for the big tech companies and rather my company thoughts on that do any, I'll open that up to both Denise and Judy if you want to come in first. Yeah, and it's, it's um, you know, it, it's not just for the, the big companies and we're, 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 you know, here at MIT, we're in conversation with actually many startups that, you know, have, uh, want to be, for example, want to be able to think through, you know, in deployment of say something in a city, what are, what are the unanticipated, you know, consequences or implications that they, they might, you know, be, be missing, uh, but want to be able to think through in advance. 
Um, one question we get from students a lot is, um, you know, uh, well, what are the regulations? And, you know, within, uh, within what I'm going to do when I leave MIT or within our setup, if we meet those regulations, aren't we just doing, you know, what we should be doing? Um, isn't that sufficient? And I, I, I think it's useful to you know, recognize that the regulation lags um, and it, it comes about because of harms that are done. Um, and harms that are brought forward and harms that are brought forward by those that have the resources to bring the, the harms forward and, and, and elevate them to that level that, you know, um, ultimately regulation is able to, to catch up to. Uh, but it's not an ideal business decision to, uh, <laughs> to sort of put blinders on uh, to all the other things that, um, you know, might go wrong in that, uh, you know, medium or long term when, when, when regulation lags. And there's really a competitive uh, advantage and sort of equality aspect to um, really getting this right. The, the technologies that we develop now, they have reach and scale that are really unprecedented. Um, you know, a, a small company can put out something that can have very vast uh, implications for, for many. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is really uh, equally important for, um, you know, for, uh, for all of those that are innovating in the labs, out into startups, out into, um, into big firms. Denise, did you want to follow up or anything to add to that? Yeah, I actually think, I mean, if you look at the laws, um, the EUAI Act, a lot of the state level laws in the United States, so those are the ones that I'm more familiar with, it's really not about necessarily the size of the company. It's about the use case and how much data you're collecting in some cases that triggers whether you fall within those, those regimes. And so I don't, I don't think it's about startups versus large incumbent businesses. Um, it's, it's really about what you're doing. <laughs> um, and, and that is just, you know, smart, you know, um, design of, of, of regulatory frameworks. It should, that's, that's kind of how it's generally done. Um, so, so I, yeah, I don't think it's, it's large versus small here in this case. Uh, I would like that to mean that organizations have a role within a value chain within a supply chain and and really we have to recognize that many organizations are global in nature are operating so if you're thinking about different regulations you may be a designer developer you know provider of ai services or you may be a purchaser a consumer or a deliverer of products that incorporate ai to the end consumer but you'll be part of a value chain and the regulations will really want to think make you think through what is your role in managing the risks and, and the opportunity around that. But I'd also say, you know, it's, it, I think it's um, actually dangerous to think that this only applies to the big technology companies because you miss a major opportunity to try and differentiate why being responsible is a positive thing for your company to do. We are increasingly going to see requirements around proving not only to the regulators, but to consumers and customers and citizens, you know, how are we trustworthy as organizations? And I think that's a great opportunity to try and move quickly to try and build those infrastructures and approaches that using techniques that Julia has been talking about or the work that Denise has been talking about to try and really help your CEOs and C-suite and consumers think about, well, here's why our business is both responsible by design and able to meet the sorts of imperatives that consumers will be demanding in the years to come. I think we've got right, time so for good, one good, good, good. Yeah, one quick, quick question and good to just say is, you know, socially good in terms of where we're at with trust and inclusiveness in your AIs. As Denise said earlier, um, just finally, one question came through, um, which is more about my question really. The reason about machines, you know, we didn't really, we talked a lot about the human side of effect, and you know, Julie here is on the robotic side. Um, you know, how do you social responsibility for the machine side of things? How, how are people considering that? Oh, I think we've got two, you know, Denise and Julie could speak to that. So I'm going to open this <laughs> up. So who wants to go first? I think Julie should go on this one. <laughs> She's sure. actually building yeah. the robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, machines, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, AI or it's a body system like a robot, they're, they're uh, every, every aspect of them is, you know, developed by people. Um, you know, you know, deep learning, you know, the, the, the data set is cultivated by, by people. The source of that data is, uh, is generated by, by people. People are, are involved in every aspect of a system, even when you think about it as a system that is deployed and, you know, aiming to operate, you know, autonomously in, in some way. And, and what that means is, you know, every aspect of these technologies is laden with our values as, as designers and the creators of it. 
Um, and it's it, it's uh, you know very important to recognize that um, up front, and then and then to be able to again at these earliest stages uh, be able to bring in additional viewpoints, uh, understand who the stakeholders are, understand who is impacted, um, and and how by these technologies and. Um, and and, uh, and and have that that artifact be realized <laughs> with uh, the broader view, not just the values that one particular designer or implementer uh, brings brings to it. Well, I think Ju Julie, thank you so much. I think that's such a powerful sort of statement to finish today's session on. Firstly, I just want to thank MIT for hosting this session and for everyone who's dialed in, whether it's in person or remotely. Really appreciate you giving time and and so sort of participating in this conversation. I also really want to thank my uh, fellow panelists and colleagues, Julie and Denise. I think your expertise just shines through in the conversation we're having, and we could have carried on for another hour or two at least, right? So thank you so much. We will try and share any links and materials that people have been asking for through MIT after this session. So just keep your eyes open or your inboxes open to those coming through. Uh, but finally, just a big thank you from me. I really uh, enjoyed this conversation and really valued and learned a, a great deal through, through this discussion. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Ali. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.